It is a great day to be alive. There's about six folk in here that are alive. It is a great day to be alive. I mean, it really is a great day to be alive. There's some folk that can complain about just about anything, but this is really a great day, and I just praise the Lord. The weather seems okay, and uh, you look well. You look well. Some of y'all must suffer from poor self-esteem. Maybe you don't think. I'm talking to you. I'm talking directly to you. You look well. You're welcome. You're welcome. It is a great day. It's been a great week. I've really enjoyed uh, being in uh, relationship and in, in the family of faith. It is good to be a part of not just this church, but this family. And so I appreciate it. I, I enjoy talking to you throughout the week. I enjoy uh, our time in the office and all of the folk that come through and call through and all of the stuff that happens around here. It, it's really a blessing. And I'm glad that uh, I have some great folk that I share that with. And uh, it's just good to see you. Enjoy worship. And uh, I thank God for Brother Hugh White and his, his uh, ministry. And to uh, all of those service ministries, our ushers, our nurses, and uh, ministers, all of you, the choir, you've done a very fine job, and we thank God for you. Thank the Lord for Reverend Haynes, does an excellent job in terms of uh, taking care of the pulpit. And uh, Sister uh, Littlefield, Minister Littlefield, has kicked it up about five or six notches. And I tell you what a wonderful message uh, this morning that uh, she brought forward. Also, some things that are going on behind the scenes, I thank the Lord for some, some special folk that have worked all week, uh, Brother Montreal Curry and Brother uh, Saunders uh, have worked really hard, uh, Brother Tracy has been out, but they've been working on the parsonage, and so uh, there's a lot of work going on over there. This week, they placed 510 ceramic tiles. Uh, one by one, and so that was quite a work, and so they're finishing uh, that project up and, and soon to start a new project, but it is interesting to see all of the work that's going in and the labor that they've brought forward, and so uh, if you are uh, handy, or maybe if you're not handy and you want to know how to get handy, just watching others be handy, uh, see Brother Curry or see Brother Saunders, and they'll be more than glad to give you their schedule in terms of when they're doing different things. And this may be an opportunity for you to come and just watch, observe, and figure out some things that you can do at your own place because uh, these, these fellas, they actually know quite a bit in the way that they do things. Uh, so it is, uh, it is a blessing. I'm looking forward to some good old picnic family fellowship. And so uh, in just a few moments, we are going to head over to the picnic, and it's not too far from here. If you hadn't planned for it, but you got time, uh, this is a picnic that is uh, sponsored by the church, so uh, you don't have to bring a dish. All you got to bring you is a you and an appetite. And we do not want to insult Deacon David Hodge. He has been over there preparing for us all morning. And so since he is there preparing for us, at the very least, we can go by and grab one of those hot dogs or hamburgers and some sides and, and just fellowship with one another for just a short time, along with our other uh, Columbus Baptist churches, because we've invited uh, and we've decided that we would host the CBA uh, picnic this year. And so they are going to come as well uh, as soon as all of the other churches are out of church. They are also going to uh, come to the uh, picnic, and we're going to have one big family picnic. Um, we got horseshoes, and so uh, it'll be uh, nice to get out there in the horseshoe pits and uh, do all of that. Then all of the games and slides for the children, they have a ball every year. I have a ball just watching everybody laughing, and I tell you, it was fun last year. Uh, uh, Brush Sloan, you remember last year? It was fun last year, and so I know it's going to be fun again this year. It's just good fellowship, so make sure that you plan after worship to join us. And it doesn't matter how you're dressed. You can be dressed up or dressed down, or you can be dressed somewhere in between. 
you're still welcome to the picnic. If you're dressed up, we're not going to make you throw a water balloon. But we will make certain to give you something to eat, and we can sit down and talk and have fun. So please uh, decide to do that after worship. And, and what a fitting year to do it in. We've been talking about family all year. And uh, today we're going to uh, look once again in uh, the epistle of 3 John. Epistle of 3 John, as a matter of fact, this is the final sermon in our John series. Remember, we started 1 John, 2 John, and now this is the final sermon in our 3 John, or in our John series, is 3 John. Now, we've gone and looked at some other characters. We've done some character studies along the way as we've looked at um, Adam and Eve, as we've looked at Jacob and Laban, as we've looked at some other relationships along the way, as we've been talking about this whole idea of family and a formula for families. What do we use? What kind of resources? What kind of tools do we need in order to keep us together? Because I've said that it seems like the family is under attack. And it's hard to stay family. It's hard to stay in relationship. Hard to keep a friend. You know, people used to have friends until they died. And nowadays you have a friend five, six years, and then you never hear from him anymore. Relationships are really under attack. And so what kind of resources can we use to keep the family together, especially church families? Well, here in 3 John, and I thank the Lord for Sister Anita Dawson who came last week. As you know, on last week I was just exhausted. It had been a long week. I was exhausted. And uh, a Sister Apostle Dawson came in here, and she had... Uh, uh, she just walked in and she was ready and did a very fine job uh, with regards to presenting last week's sermon. So if I might just give you uh, from my notes on last week, had I preached last week, uh, note number one, of course, was give and don't take from the Gentiles. And uh, one of the things that I would wanted to point out to you is that we have taken so much from the world and given so little. It seems that the church is beginning to even take uh, the music style of the world and we sample uh, the first time I heard Prince music in the church I thought I would just about have a pure heart attack I thought I needed to see a cardiologist or either a brain specialist because I could not believe that I was hearing the rhythm of Prince uh, and hearing gospel singing alongside of it. And I think that there's something to be said about that. The church ought to be giving its creativity. Our God created everything. Does anybody know that? And so if our God is the creator of all, don't you think the Lord can give us a unique sound and allow us to play the instrument in a unique way that praises God rather than to go and take a song that Prince wrote uh, that oftentimes was full of, of sexual innuendo and so on and so forth and bring that into the church. I think that that is an indictment against the church because we're not tapping into the resources of creativity that God gives us. And there's some people that says, well, that, that helps us to connect with people. Uh, that helps us to connect with people if we're able to use the music of the world. But let me remind you that on one side of the Bible, we hear about the story of Babel and how they were building the Tower of Babel and God confused them and their voices uh, then became that of different languages and they could no longer communicate in the same way that they had. Uh -huh. But let me also take you to the time of Pentecost in the book of Acts and remind you that when the Holy Spirit entered into the church and into their prayer meeting that even though there were people of all different kinds of races and people from all over the world that when the, the voice of the Lord, when the word of God came forward, they all understood it in their language. And so let me tell you, whether there be sinner or saint in the church today, when the gospel goes forward according to his word, his word does not come back void, but it goes forth and it accomplishes what it was sent forth to do. And so I'm going to tell you, I don't need Chris to tell you how to uh, uh, act and how to live. I don't need Michael Jackson to praise the Lord. I can praise God in the uniqueness of the Holy Spirit as it leads me. As the Bible says in groanings and moaning, sometimes I might have to moan. Sometimes I might, might have to groan. And it might not sound good to those who are outside of the faith. It might be a mystery to you. But I tell you what, God hears me. And he knows the songs that are coming out of my, my heart. And sometimes we make fun, but this one don't sing good and that one don't sing good and what? 
or not. But God loves us. And he accepts the, the pureness in our heart. Because sometimes the folk who have the best voices and the best singers are the very ones who will not praise God. But I tell you, I got to praise him. I can't uh, help it. And so whether it's on key or off key. And so we have to give something to the world rather than taking something from the world. Right now. And so not only that, uh, she said we're in this together, and we certainly are in this together. We're in this together, but not only are we together in the church, we are also inextricably bound to those who are outside of the church. It is our job to, pro to project Christ in such a way that those who are on the outside desire to be inside. Uh, this, this, this church, and I thank God for it, uh, the Lord has blessed us to have all these wonderful windows and one of the reasons that we had them painted and one of the reasons that there are banners in the window is because we recognize that we ought to be saying come on in here. Yeah. We, we want to make sure that when folk are passing by that they recognize that there's something different going in that going on in that place that used to be a furniture store yeah. and they recognize they say it used to be a furniture store that kind of funny and so hopefully by the time they get to court right they might remember that Jesus was a carpenter that he built things and then he put things together and say, you know what, maybe I need to go back and take my life over to the furniture store and give it over to the Lord who can recreate and make me fresh and new. And so once again, we're in this together and we ought to be so happy and so joy. You know, it's a shame that the church has a funeral 52 times a week, a month, a year. See, every Sunday I'll not be saying. Come on now. When I wake up on Sunday morning, I'm not waking up to come serve anything dead. Right. When I wake up on Sunday morning, when I tell you it's a great day to be alive, that's how I feel. I enjoy life. I'm glad to be alive. I recognize that I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, but guess what? God has given us some more time. God has given us more time than Sister Louisville said to have hope. He's given us more time to have faith. He's given us more time to get it right. You was broke last week, but God can bless you with two nickels this week. And so therefore, we must continue to live in the joy of life, in the abundance of life, and recognize that, guess what? As little as you got, you got so much more than so many others. And so we are in this thing together. But then don't get caught up in yourself. Don't get caught up in the, in the fantasy and don't get caught up in, in believing that you have truly arrived to the extent that you're better than somebody else. Because you know what? We're all in this thing. We all have our issues. We've all got our problems. And as, as, uh, as the boys said, we can give each to each what each so sadly lacks. And so there's some things that we lack in our lives and there's some things that somebody else lacks. But when we come together, we're able to help one another through the struggles and through the stress and strain of life. And so uh, if there's a blessing here that's, kept, that's found in these resources that we're able to use for family. And so on last week we left off and we were talking uh, there in verse 9 about Diotrephes. Diotrephes was one who was talking about and uh, using his words against the church. Doesn't say necessarily that he was physical, but he wanted to be uh, the, the one who had control over the church. He wanted to be the one in control. And oftentimes that's what messes up the church, is that there's somebody who wants to always be uh, out front. When all of us have to be in this for the sake of Christ and not for our own egos. It's not about who I am or who you are, it is about Christ. Right. And so that is one of the reasons here at this church that people have asked me any number of times uh, uh, about names. You know, why didn't we put names in the bulletin or names on the sign outside and all that kind of thing? It's because our names are not important. The name that is most important, if we were going to put a name on the outside of the church, it ought to say Liberty Hill Baptist Church, pastored, led, and guided by the Holy Spirit. You see, that's really the guide. And when you look at the bulletin, who guides the church? The Holy Spirit guides the church. In terms of who I am and what my name is and all of those kinds of things, that's really not important. When you come into church, what is important when you leave here is not that you know the pastor's name. What's important when you leave here is that you know the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, that you know how Christ has led us, what God has done for us to deliver us, to redeem us, to justify us through salvation. That is what's important. When we wake up in the morning, one of the reasons sometimes we're waking up so sad is because we're focused on the wrong thing. For me to wake up in the morning and know that my pastor Troy Shaw 
Arkansas and the, and the, the, the church is located 4410 Refugee Road, that's not going to make me happy. Matter of fact, that might make me sad if I think about it too long because I think about the pastor, he losing his hair and sometimes losing his mind. And so I, don't, I can't get, get no strength from that. But if I wake up in the morning and I focus on Jesus that has died for us and, and resurrected on the third day morning and left for us the comfort of the Holy Spirit, then I have joy in my heart, an unspeakable joy, that no man can take away because no man gave it to me. There was a song that we used to sing in the church years ago, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. And so we got to stay focused on him. And so this particular character, he was talking against the church used his mouth against the church. And so what the writer says, if you look at verse 10, it says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. And so what the writer says here is that he's not going to forget what has been done. And so I submit to you today that in the family, if we really want to keep the family together, formula for families, we need to remember some deeds. We need to remember some deeds. See, sometimes we talk about forgiveness and we talk about forgetting. But when we talk about forgiving and forgetting, we're not talking about the devil. Got quiet. We're not talking about forgetting the devil. Because if you forget the devil, then you will forget that there is another power out there. It is not a supreme power, but it is a movement that takes place in some of our lives. All of us are affected by the enemy. Some of us are living for the enemy. Some of us are living after the enemy. Okay, let me show you. The Bible tells me in Romans, it says, I believe that's 623 or what's the memory verse? Here it is. I'll give you the verse and some of you scholars will tell me exactly where it is. It says, all have come short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is that, Romans 3.23 or 6.23? 6.23. Check the Bible. Now some of you should know this, and I'm, I'm not calling you out, but some of y'all should know this, because y'all went through about a 10-week course, Billy Graham Crusade course, and you had memory verses, and this is one of them. And so I'm, I'm just making sure, but I'm, I'm thinking it's 6.23. 3.23. 3.23. My numbers get mixed up. So it's 323. There you go. Now you can remember. 323. Three. It's a two sandwich between two threes. There you go. So you got a sandwich. But anyway, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So therefore, all of us have come in contact with the enemy at some point in time. Okay, you don't have it. I'll go here. And then you'll, maybe you'll get it. There's a woman... She has a boyfriend, and that boyfriend looks like either me or Brother Curry, maybe Brother Wesley, because we all have beards. I'm only using us because we got beards. And so this boyfriend got a beard, and he does not treat her right. And he's always talking about her. He's always going out on her and everything else. And so she's frustrated with him. And finally, she puts him out because she went through so much with this man. He shaves and comes back. You're going to get that in a minute. He shaves and he comes back. And because she did not remember what his eyes looked like and his nose and his mouth and the shape of his head, she allows him back only to abuse her again. Mercy, mercy. And so now, you ready for the punchline? Some things oh, no. need to be remembered. Yes, yes, yes. See, because if you forget what the devil did to you, then you will continue to allow him back in your life over and over again. And so the writer says, I'm not going to forget because there's some things that have been done to us that we sometimes need to remember. It doesn't mean that we're unforgiving. It just means that I remember so that I don't walk in the same mistakes over and over 
again, you got to remember what it was like before in order for you to continue to walk in the newness that God has given you. I remember when I was beat up. I remember when I was lied on. I remember when I was cheated on. And no thank you, I changed the locks. I remember the day I changed the locks. And now that I got new keys to both the dead boat and the turnabout, I'm not letting you back in. All right. And so you got to remember, some folks forgot the last time they came to God on their knees. There's a whole lot of folks that come to God on their knees when they need something. Uh -huh. That's right. But then they forget the Lord. I forget God after I get my job. I forget God after I get my money. I forget God after the death of my mother has passed and I've gone on about my life. I forget. But let me tell you, you need God. And in order to remember, 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 you got to remember what happened to you before. Yeah. I look at Sister Kelly. I look at my mother-in-law. I look at her family. And I think about some of the folk in my past. And I shout hallelujah because I remember the deeds of others. It causes me to appreciate yeah. the God that has blessed me with the newness of life. I'll just put it like that. Amen. Verse 11 says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. In the Greek, when you look at this word follow in this particular text, it has the connotation to mimic, to act like, to, to almost parrot. And you know, I think that it's important for us to recognize that if we really want the family to stay together, we must know who to mimic, who to follow. Because far too often, we try to judge ourselves by something that is less important or something that is, is uh, inferior to where we ought to be. There's a whole lot of folks that try to base their marriage on other folks' marriage. Try to base their kids on other folks' kids. Their children, they come to their parents and try to base the relationship on what somebody else's mama did for them. So-and-so got to go, why can't I go? Because you're not so-and-so's child. Because you don't have the ability to follow after everybody. My, my children can't follow after everybody's kids. My kids got to follow after me. Uh, uh, we can't, and I say this to our officers all the time, just because the church down the street, up the road and around the corner does something else, this is Liberty Hill. The standard at Liberty Hill is different than the standard in other places. The standard for leadership is different than the standard for leadership in other places. I'm not saying that other churches are not as good as Liberty Hill. I'm not saying that we're better. I'm saying that there are times when we're different. And because we're different, there's a different standard around here. We don't follow after everybody else's way just because it's their tradition. And so what if it's their tradition? Our tradition is to seek after and to look toward what God is doing. I don't need to know what the neighbors are doing. I'm not trying to keep up with the Joneses. I'm trying to keep up with the Holy Spirit. So what if the Joneses got a new Cadillac? I'm going to drive the Chevy that God gave me. So what if the Joneses just bought a, a new awnings for their house and they put new sod on their, their grass and they've got good flowers? I don't care what God has given me is for me. And I'm going to thank him when I rise that he has blessed me. Comparing yourself to something that is inferior that God hasn't given to you. Your blessing is your blessing. And you ought to thank God that you've been blessed. It might not look like mine. But it's yours. Because the Lord recognizes that you have different needs than I have. And each of us have different, we have different needs. We have different things that the Lord has given us and gifted us with. And so we can't just follow everybody. Our young people definitely need to think about this, Sister Jeray. We need to recognize that we can't follow after everybody. Yeah. Got to realize that, you know what, if you want to be special, you got to follow special people. That's right. That's right. And if you want to be wise, you got to follow wise people. That's right. If you want to be what they are, then keep on hanging out with them. That's right. That's and so you need to go back and check your Instagram. You need to go back and read your Facebook And if I might speak prophetically, let me tell you what your timeline will look like in the future. If you keep on hanging out with thugs and that's your timeline for the last few weeks, the last few months, then let me tell you, ultimately your timeline 
will be that you are now a thug. Keep on hanging out with the drunkards and the and the and the depressed folk and the negative folk. And before you know it, you will be just like them. You need to follow what you want to be like. If you want to be wealthy and healthy and wise, you need to follow some wealthy and healthy folk. Because if your friends are still sick and depressed and broke, and you still following that same crowd, and you're trying to figure out, well, I wonder why I don't have no money. It's because you're wasting your money at the same club they're wasting their money at. Man. Who are you going to follow? If we want to be successful, we got to find folk that are successful. You know, I didn't sit in the back of the class. Sister White, I couldn't afford to sit in the back of the class. Maybe some folk are smart enough to try and sit in the back of the class and get it. And I couldn't sit in the back of the class. I had to sit in the front of the class. And then Brother Colson, sometimes I had to reposition myself. Because if I saw somebody, Sister Carter, who was sitting in the front of the class, had their hand raised, and they were asking good questions, and I saw them taking notes, then I repositioned myself. So not just the front of the class, but I sat near the smart people. Sister Neva Chapman, if the truth be told, I'm not all that bright. But the Lord has gifted me to know bright people. And so since I can discern those who are bright, then that's the folk that I want to be positioned around. In ministry, I had a meeting yesterday morning. I was talking to another preacher. And, you know, he was telling me some of the things that he has gone through spiritually and some of the things the Lord had done for him and how the Lord had shown him some things and how he was attempting to live a righteous life. The interesting part about it is I didn't know this preacher a year ago, but another friend of mine, matter of fact, there's no secret who the friend is, Dr. Kevin Dudley, had called me and he said, you know, I got somebody you need to meet. And he said, I, I want to hook y'all up so that y'all can meet and begin to, to talk and begin to minister in each other's lives because I know that this brother really cares about the way ministry is done. He cares about God. He cares about living a righteous and holy life. And so I want you to meet. And so what I'm saying to you, Sister Morel, is that after a while, depending on who you follow and who you are, other folk will recognize in you some things that line up with other people that are like you. And before you know know it, you can have the right kind of network, and you can have people that are with you that have the same kind of idea and vision and see the Lord and his relationship in the same way. See, just like you meet folk and they tell you that you can do this and we can go out together and we can do that, the same thing can happen in the presence of God. And so we've got to know who to follow and who to connect ourselves with because as we connect ourselves with, with those kind of things, and, and, and this is all I'm going to say about this point, and I'll move on. Reverend Haynes and I were talking about it in the pulpit this morning. I know Deacon Palmer and, and, and Minister Curry know what I'm talking about, but we were talking about something that happened in the office this week, and we said it's amazing what God is doing in Liberty Hill, and we're just looking forward to the next couple of years as they unfold. And Reverend Haynes looked at me and said, I wish I could sleep at night because I've been just up thinking about what God is doing. And it's amazing when you can hook up with other folk that are going in the same direction because you're following after God and you're saying, I want to do what's good and what's right. I actually want to feed some folk that are hungry. I want to help the folk who are homeless. I want to pray for those who are in need. I want to do that. And so follow after what is good and not which is bad. Stop trying to look for the loophole and look for God. But then look at verses 12 and 13. Or better yet, just go straight to 14. 13 and 14. I'll spit the difference. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet thy friends by name. We need to remember some deeds. We need to know who to follow. But then we need to know how to greet each other. Interestingly enough, we've been talking about relationships all year. Sister Thelma, we've talked about 
how we treat each other in family, how we relate to each other. What can we do, Sister Bree, to keep this thing together? I tell you that part of our problem is we become too impersonal. Part of our problem, Sister Jasmine Moore, is that we've become impersonal. We've had to come into a society where it seems extremely electronic. Everything is electronic. People say now that they'd rather send you a text message than to talk to you. I think it was about two years ago, I asked my daughter, Brittany, I said, well, why would you want to send a text message over actually calling somebody? It seems more difficult to send a text message. And she said to me that when the conversation is over, it's easier to end it. Because the last text you read, you don't have to respond. I thought about that. That's very interesting. Uh -huh. That we're okay living in a society where it's okay just not to respond. Wow. And so now we've become very electronic in the way that we do things. I remember at least three occasions in this church where I've talked to families and I've talked to husband and wife who had knocked down, drag out argument because of texting. One of the things is because you can't hear the tone in a text. Sometimes people read stuff into things. Even though it may not necessarily mean that, but because the family has begun to have these conversations over texts. I heard one parent even talk about frustration in terms of families texting in the house. We've become so impersonal that we're sending emails and sending texts and we're, 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 we're posting on Facebook. It's one thing to have somebody who lives a million miles away or in the military and so on and so forth. But when your birthday comes up, is it, wouldn't it be okay if somebody actually just called you and said, happy birthday? But now we, we get a pop-up on Facebook that says it's that person's birthday and it gives you all people's birthday for that day and you can say happy birthday to them all at the same time. <laughs> We've become so impersonal. There are people who are in this church and I'm glad that this church has become extremely excited but I remember when we first started there were some people who said I'm just a little bit scared. Pa Pastor, you're talking about that from now on, we're going to do Bible study in community and in relationship, and I'll actually have to look at somebody in their eyes and know their name, and they'll know my name. I don't know if I feel comfortable with that. Oh, no. I like being lost in the crowd. I, I like coming to the church and just kind of looking around and not necessarily knowing everybody. I don't know if I want to know everybody, and I don't know if I want them to know me. But the writer here is begging us to be more personal. It is saying that yes, it is good to write the check to the homeless shelter, but how about you show up in person? Yes, it is good. And, and, and I'm not trying to say that you need to stop saying happy birthday on, on Facebook, but I am saying that you need to consider that there are times that call for our personal touch. There are times that call for us to be face-to-face. -face. There are times where we need to have some more face-to-face -face conversation with our spouse. There are times where we need to cut the television off and actually have a dinner, whether it is one of our fast food McDonald's dinners or whether it is a home-cooked meal. Sometimes we need to stop the car, pull it over, park in a parking space, and actually sit and have our french fries and hamburgers with our children. Now, pastor's not advocating that kind of diet, but if that's the kind of diet you have, at least have some time that is personal with your children and so that they might truly have a happy meal. Because you're sitting down and you're talking to them and you're personal, you're face to face. We can't always do it in the impersonal way. But it's okay to be personal. It's all right to be face to face. It's okay. You're getting this, you're getting this uh, knowledge and you're getting this sermon from somebody as you know who is a germaphobe. I, I don't like to be too personal because you might give me something. But if I might think about that from the, from the physical to the spiritual, there are times, to be quite honest, I have to stretch myself, especially in the wintertime as you're coughing and sneezing.
anything and you come to the door and I shake your head and tell you God bless you and I hope to see you again next week. Sometimes I'm thinking, but maybe you ought not come back until you feel better. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is sometimes we're also afraid to touch each other spiritually. That's all right. Because we're scared that somebody else's sin might rub off on us. But let me tell you today, and let me remind myself, I'm preaching to Troy Shaw right now, I just want to remind us that the scriptures tell us that he who is inside of us is greater. It's greater than anything that's on the outside of us. It's greater than this whole world, that which is inside of us. That gift that God has given us, that the writer says that we ought to stir up within us, it has the power to protect us. And even when we get sick from somebody else, he still has the power to heal us. And so all we've got to do is look to God and recognize that he's been personal with us. Because no matter how low you've been, he was still God enough, but humble enough to reach down and pick us up and place us back in the right place. And no matter how many times we've fallen, he still says, I'm here knocking, waiting for you. Doesn't matter what you used to be. He still gives us hope that we shall be. Even more than we can even think of even right now. Because he shall translate us that we might worship with him forever and forever. But until that time, let us be in relationship with one another. For he says that we must love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. But love our neighbor as ourselves. How can you love your neighbor if you never cross over the yard? That's right. That's right. Every now and then you've got to cross the yard in order to love your neighbor. He says, go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Sometimes you've got to get off the porch to do God's work. Sometimes we just want to be on the porch. We want, to, we want to do the things under the shadow of our own porch so that we might stay close to home. Sometimes the work of the Lord will take you down the block. to take you around the way where you shall see those who are in need. Where you shall see those who really are hurting. I close by telling you, the other day I was driving down the street. <coughs> Brother Montreal Curry and I had come from the old church building, stopped to get a bite of eat to eat, come down the road, and all of a sudden I saw something, and I'm still trying to figure out why didn't I think of that. We got to the corner of Whittier and Lockbourne. If you're familiar with that area there, there's a group of apartment buildings there, or Row houses. It been boarded up for a while. Grass overgrown. No one lives in there, and you can speculate that maybe at times people may go in there to do things that they ought not do. And on the corner there was a man standing on that corner, and you could tell that this person seemed beat up by life. And so here he is, standing beat up by life and yet in the shadow of extreme poverty. And so finally, you sit there at the light, you see two sisters. When I say sisters, I think you know what I mean. One of them had her Bible open. The other one was standing and you could tell she was praying and talking to the Lord. And right there on that corner, in the shadow of this house that's torn down and wrecked, here this man hurting, but then there's the presence of the church. The presence of God's people standing there on the corner, allowing the Lord to be seen in them. And if I might say, Sister Littlefield, they were allowing the hope to come forward. And so that is my closing question as we think about these three letters of John. The writer says to us in each of these messages and in all of these texts, the writer says to us, even as we see the hurt and the pain of life, even as we see that in the shadow of depravity, there's still hope. 
There should still be the faith that comes from us to believe that God can change the world. Right. That no matter how bad our marriages have gotten, no bad, matter how bad our children have gotten, no matter how bad it gets in the church. And sometimes, uh, as my grandmother used to say, teeth and tongue fall out. But even as you stand in the, the shadow of, of poverty and in, in, in depravity and depression, let me remind us, Sister Magwood, there's a shadow that's greater than that. There's a shadow that's greater than your picture windows that says past due, whether they be pink or yellow. That there is a shadow that is greater than, than a car that, you know, stops at the red light and you've got to restart it to get it to go. There, there, there is a shadow that is greater, Brother Colson, than all of the divorce papers that lawyers can present. Oh, oh yeah, there's a shadow that's greater than a school teacher that calls home several times because a child just hasn't gotten it right yet. That there is a shadow that's greater than having to take care of a sick parent. There's a shadow that's greater than what the doctor says about you. But there is a shadow that was cast upon us by the cross of Calvary. A shadow that says no matter what the pain, no matter what the hurt is, my arms are still stretched out wide. There is yet a shadow that allows us to recognize that no matter how bad it gets, there's a shadow that says that no matter how dark it gets, there's a shadow that says, you know what, they took him down and they put him in a barber tomb and the story doesn't end there. Because it doesn't end there, I'm able to move on and to live on and to love on. Because I recognize no matter how bad it gets, that after the crucifix there was the resurrection. And so there are some crucifixes that come in our lives. There's some times where I feel like I've been downtrodden, but thank God he got up early one morning. And because he got up, each of us have the ability to continue to keep on keeping on. Because in him, we all rise. Amen.